Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. Introductions. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this morning, uh, we are joined by a collection of people who are going to talk to you about a part of public health that we all like heard a little bit about during the pandemic, um, but who do this work day in and day out on infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. And the work that we're going to talk about today. Um, focuses on um, the health of individual people, but also um, potential safety concerns for our community. And so I think we have a really good panel pulled together of people who can talk to you about a piece of their work we don't often talk about. So what I'd like to do today is um, ask the people, the facilitators to introduce themselves, and then we'll move on to the panel and ask you to introduce yourself, and then we'll get going with questions. Good morning, I'm Lisa Fries, and I'm the Transportation Services Director. Tony Winnicke, County Highway Engineer. Paul Gustafson, a Business Relationship Manager in the Transformation and Enterprise Services Division. Uh, my name is Ben Troop. I work with Environmental Services. I uh, kind of coordinate uh, well water testing for the county. Uh, Maria Mays Flores, Public Health Nurse. Lisa Brodsky, Public Health Director. Cynthia Smith-Strat, City of Belle Plaine, Community Development Director. Uh, Stacey Ward, I'm a public health nurse. Jody Larris, I'm the supervisor of the Public Health um, Disease Prevention and Control. <clears throat> and then Michael will be joining us. He has to do our video DOTs this morning, so. All right, um, I'm gonna start with the first question. Um, I wonder, um, Lisa, if you could just take a brief moment and just talk about um, tuberculosis and the protocol for tuberculosis um, treatment uh, that would be in reference to page eight. Just to sort of set the stage for, for what that requires. Um, certainly. So, uh, and actually, Jody could probably speak a little bit uh, more to this. Um, but uh, every um, per, uh, TB client that has active TB uh, requires a personal visit. It's called direct observed therapy. And um, we see each client daily. Um, it is a requirement. Uh, we have to watch them take their medication. Um, we interview them to see if they're, any, if they're having any uh, reactions to the medication. We make sure that they're seeking their treatment and we coordinate that treatment as well. Um, previously, uh, about five years ago, most of those were being done in person, so we would drive all over the county and we would do in-person visits. Um, we have shifted our model uh, to where we have to see them uh, at least once a week in person and the rest are done video if they have those capabilities. In some cases we can't, but for the most part, about 90-ish percent of our visits are done virtually, uh, which uh, increases our efficiency and saves the county money. Great, thank you for that. So if someone could just speak to, on page eight, we, you have a, a chart that shows the percent of current um, patients with TB who are compliant with treatment. So what does it mean to be compliant with treatment? So to be compliant with treatment means that they're taking their medicine every day like they're supposed to, as, as it's been prescribed. Um, I just want to make comment that you can cross off the seven and turn it to eight and likely nine. Um, we just had one come in yesterday uh, with active TB, and it has a, a one-year-old in the household, so that means there's likely to be um, treatment for the one-year-old um, as they're going through the, the determination if the baby is infected or not. So can I just, just to just be really clear, so this is a highly infectious disease. So being in compliance with treatment, is that like they miss one treatment and they're, or, or how does that work? Yeah, no, no. Um, to be non-compliant would mean to be refusing their meds okay. consistently. Okay. Um, and, and truthfully, it's not something you can refuse. Um, if someone were to say, nope, I'm not going to do that, um, we can then invoke the public health threat law um, and we can hospitalize them and treat them. So it's not something that 
really if you can refuse treatment. So if someone does refuse treatment, they can be involuntary placed in a hospital. Yep. Thank yep. you. And we haven't had to do that. No. Yet. Ever. Ever we, we have come close, but um, we haven't had to do that. And the commissioner of health would be the person that would declare um, and put them uh, in uh, isolation. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, I want to speak a little bit when you asked about the treatment of, so the, the DOT, the direct observed therapy, is certainly a big part of the treatment, um, but and we're involved with the whole case management part of, you know, we get the information from the Department of Health that there's someone that um, has TB. So, you know, that starts us with, okay, you know, are they home? Are they, you know, do we need to get them um, into a clinic? We may have to schedule them an appointment um, at their own, well, typically an infectious disease clinic. Sometimes um, we can get them in at uh, Hennepin County Public Health Clinic um, for their TB workup and then prescribe um, meds. Um, treatment is a very um, well-planned out um, plan of four different drugs that we start them on. Um, typically, they take those four drugs until we find out if the um, TB bacteria is sensitive to them. And if they are, then we can eliminate one. And then after 60 days, we eliminate a second one. Okay. Um, we get sputums. If they're smear positive, then we're collecting sputums <clears throat> and getting them down to the clinic to get those tested. Um, they have to do a sputum sample once a week um, until the first one, until it comes back negative, then we collect two more that week um, in order for them to come off isolation. Um, so there's a lot of behind the scene things that is involved with um, the treatment of someone with TB beyond the um, directly observed therapy. Sure, thank you. They are usually with us also. This isn't a short thing. It's six to nine months, and it could go up to a year or two, but typically it's six to nine months where they see us or communicate with us daily. All right, thank you. Next question. Um, I would like to ask some questions around the public nuisance uh, ordinance. I know that we um, passed the ordinance here in Scott County in 2020, and um, it looks like there's been a significant increase on page 13 in the data since then. And um, maybe talk about how this has been a positive tool, what it's enabled you to do that maybe previously in the past you were not able to do. Certainly, um, I can start that one. Um, so prior to act us actually having an ordinance, um, we were still mandated by the Minnesota Statute 145A to respond. However, we did not have the tools in place uh, in order to effectively respond or even work with the cities. So the cities were on their own, the county was on their own. Um, the nuisance ordinance did enable us, it put some very specific things in place. We worked with Jeannie Anderson, we created some, um, some very good um, language in our ordinance that allows us to go into the home, declare a public health nuisance, they, and, and tell them that they have 10 days to clean up. Um, this also enabled us to work closely with the city. We do have a city partner here um, from Bell Plain, and we've worked on um, several nuisances uh, since uh, since we have the ordinance in place, and, and maybe um, since you, um, you can speak to um, how well that's going. But one of the things that, you know, at that time we only had three, four nuisances per year. Um, we have seen a dramatic increases in public health nuisances, and I believe that COVID um, probably brought a lot of those to light, as well as some education. And plus now the cities have the ability to reach out to us, and we have been able to work together to clean up several nuisances that either were, um, that we knew about, that we couldn't do anything about, or um, that have been now brought to our attention because the city now has this tool. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to maybe talk a little yes. more. Yes, uh, Cynthia, City of Belle Plaine. Met Jody and Lisa when we were working on the nuisance ordinance, which was welcomed by our community. Uh, our entry to public nuisance is usually via code enforcement. City of Belle Plaine is a reactive, not a proactive, approach to code enforcement, so we need a complaint to actually investigate whether or not there is a code 
violation, in this case, a nuisance violation. Typically, the entry point for these types of uh, nuisances are either a neighbor, a concerned family member, a person who is a first responder, or it's we're on a rental inspection and we find an apartment. Most of the time, it's related to hoarding and garbage houses. So it is a concern, obviously, for the person who lives there. It's also a concern for our building official because sometimes we have a lot of items that are piled up and it interferes with the structural integrity of the building. So that's a concern. Also, our first responders, especially our firefighters, if there's a lot of, of uh, narrow passageways or flammable material or combustible material. Fires don't act like they typically do. So we have fires that burn faster and we have no way of knowing, you know, how to navigate the interior of the building. So that is a direct impact on the neighbors as well. So for us, it's really important. We find that we are most successful when we have a team approach when we can work with the individual, when we can work with the family, when we can provide resources. When we can't deal with this locally, we're going to reach out to either Jody or Lisa, and we're going to ask for assistance because you bring a total new set of tools to help us try to help remedy this situation. This is a real issue. I would say we deal with probably 10 situations a year, and they don't always turn out successful. Unfortunately, we had one individual that we were unable to help. So it is real. We certainly appreciate the teamwork, and I appreciate the resource. And we are doing good work here. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and I'll follow up. Um, typically, um, it's been very cooperative. Um, when we've gone in, we've offered resources. It's gotten cleaned up. We have had, in two occasions, uh, not in Belle Plaine, we've had to order a cleanup where we had to step in. But that is not the norm. Um, we have been doing very well on the cleanup piece and remediating the nuisances. I think where we're falling short still, um, well, one of the things is we don't have any staff to do nuisances, so you have your public health director and a supervisor going out and, you know, checking how many different types of cockroaches there are in homes. I mean, these are, it's, it's part of the job. But um, we're doing well on getting it cleaned up. Um, however, in most of the cases, and, and when we go, we go on a team. I'm kind of the enforcer, and Jody's the public health nurse bringing resources. Um, cleanup resources have been well accepted. It's that mental health component for hoarding that we really haven't had anybody going, yes, I have a mental health issue, I need, I need help. So we continue to monitor some of those houses. It's chances are um, we're going to have to go back uh, because typically there's an underlying mental health condition that um, is causing the hoarding issue, um, and uh, they're just not ready for help yet. Um, they've cleaned up because they've had to, or we've cleaned it up for them. Unfortunately, in some cases, we may cause further trauma, but if it's impacting the neighborhood, there really is no give and take there. Um, especially if there's other sanitation issues that are causing additional problems on top of the hoarding. Um, but there was a suggestion, and I think uh, for future steps, um, we may look at maybe doing a coordinated response kind of model, bringing mental health with us, and hopefully we can remediate a little bit better on the mental health component. What isn't reflected here, these are just cases that we have responded to. Um, that we take many, many phone calls throughout the year and just provide uh, instructions or information and connect them with resources on the phone. So these are just the cases that we've actually go out and actually physically have to do something. Uh, Cynthia, I was just kind of wondering, uh, since you mentioned you have approximately 10 cases a year that are nuisance related, do you always escalate them up to public health or is there a threshold that you work with where it gets escalated? And Maybe you could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah. That's a great question, Lisa, and I think the answer is our process is likely evolving. It really is, uh, we work as a team in code enforcement and with our police department to try to identify who may be able to best reason with the individuals involved. Sometimes if they're apartments, it's relatively easy because you have an apartment manager or property owner that has an interest in 
in uh, having the apartment cleaned up as well. Um, we probably spend at least 60 days locally trying to remedy situations. If we get absolutely no cooperation, our goal is always progress, not perfection. perfection. If we get absolutely no cooperation, or we feel that the life of the individual who is in the garbage house is in imminent danger, we are reaching out to Lisa and Jody immediately. What's the crossover on these cases with adult protection and with child protection? Um, some, many, some. You know, it, it, it's hard to say. Um, I think the one cockroach one that that you had, Lisa, there was a there were children somewhere in there involved. Um, adult protection. It's a little harder because you know they have to meet the criteria of a vulnerable adult. Um, to be considered in adult protection. Um, so we oftentimes have gone out with adult protection. Um, maybe they get the report first, or maybe we get the report first, but we go out together um, to talk with them. They can then assess, is this a vulnerable adult situation? Um, and we can assess what's going on, and you know, is it a public health um, threat? And so we are able to work together in, in that way. Okay. Um, so, Thanks. It, yeah, there's, there's some vulnerable adults, some not. And I, I would say most of the hoarding case, like it, in the grand picture, I would say about 25 to 35% of our cases involve APS or CPS. Most of the hoarding, like we're seeing them most with the hoarding cases, especially the extreme hoarding. Thank you. All right, let's bring Ben into the fold here. Um, so on page 12, the uh, water test totals per year. Can you talk a little bit about what this figure is showing us? Are there any trends and levels are high? What, uh, what do we do to help out for any sort of uh, mitigation? So the graph is just kind of depicting um, every test that we sell. Um, Per year, um, you'll see that on in 2019 and 2023, we have a lot more. Um, that is probably due to we send out a flyer to all the private well users in the county, and uh, just a reminder that this is something that was probably in your best interest. Um, it's not a requirement, but as you can see, we get a pretty good turnout for people that want to know um, what's in their drinking water. Um, I guess, uh, Tony, can I, can I ask a follow-up to that? Yeah. So Ben, how worried should people be about the quality of water as it relates to lead? Well, as it relates to lead, um, not, not too much. Um, the Department of Health, we work with them a lot, um, trying to like just investigate why there's high lead in some houses and some not. A lot of the time it's uh, older homes, it's the plumbing inside the pipes. Um, it almost, it's very rare that there's lead coming out of the groundwater. Okay. It's almost always um, either public utility. There, it's like kind of an ongoing investigation on why there's okay. high lead. But um, I guess this, 2023 compared to 2022, there's more, we, we found more houses with mm -hmm. high, well, high lead. Um, high lead is, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, just because any lead is above the standard. The standard is zero. Okay. So um, we had more just because the volume of tests was so much more. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just also clarify um, prior to 2011, uh, we would, I mean, we respond to lead cases, and prior to 2011, that threshold wasn't zero. It was uh, 10 uh, micrograms of lead per deciliter. And in 2011, they changed that, and that's for children under six, um, because we know that lead impacts uh, brain development and it impacts children's ability to learn. So the cutoff used to be 10, so we would have an actionable item at 10. In 2011, they cut that in half to five 
uh, micrograms per deciliter, and I believe it was last year, MDH uh, changed it once again to match what the CDC's recommendation was of 3.5. So it's, it's not, again, zero, but if you can look on page 11, you can see the impact of that for us is it's every time they change it, it's increased the number of cases. It doubled our number of cases, more than doubled our number of cases. We usually had four to, about four a year, three a year. Last year, we had 11 cases. Um, and I believe this is attributed to the reducing of the actionable lead. So at right now we're responding to anything above 3.5. None of our, most of our lead cases, or none of our lead cases actually have been connected to water. It's been uh, mostly lead paint. Um, we've had some related to some spices that have been brought overseas that contain lead. Mm. Um, and so most we don't ever find out what the true source is. You know, MDH will go out with us if it's a higher level um, and, and do testing um, on the, at the home. And, you know, they don't always find something that tests positive for lead. So then it could be, you know, the parents um, bringing th things in. I remember the last county that I worked at, we had a dad that worked at a battery factory. And he was, he actually was the source. It was on his clothes when he would come home from work and the kids would hug him. Um, and so that was where they were getting the lead. So um, it, it, unfortunately, we don't usually find a definitive um, thing, but we did find the lead in some spices that had been brought over. Um, and apparently it makes the color more brilliant of the spices, and it makes it heavier, so it costs more. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's what we have found. Um, Michael, any other? Any other ones that we were definitive on? Not that I remember. A lot of them were just kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Couldn't figure out where the source was, but then as we do testing, they do venous draws, it go, gets a little. Yeah. Yes, we Chair, got a question. Um, can I ask a question? Um, recently, there's been a lot of conversations regarding PFOFs and PFOFs testing in water. Is that something that we're doing at the, are we doing? Well, we don't offer any. PFOS testing, all that's been done would be through the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Um, I want to walk back to your narrative a little bit because there's a lot of conversations in here that support the data that we're seeing in the graphs. And um, I did on page two and on page four, I just want to reference that um, you talk about a framework that lays out your minimum set of disease prevention um, and that that framework is being edited or revised as we speak. Um, and then also on page four, apologize for the page wrestling here, um, because of current caseloads and vacancies, we're unable to focus on prevention work and developed and implemented a continuity of operations plan to focus on the most critical tasks. Can you talk about if you, if you could influence the, the draft of the minimum requirements for prevention and also the increased caseloads that you've been seeing, how would you like to influence what you've been experiencing in terms of public health, in terms of the activities that you need to provide and the, the caseloads continuing to go up and how you can predict and manage those caseloads? A lot of questions. In yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's a theme. Sorry. <laughs> so so our, our framework really is looking at, you know, what is – Dividing up because we work very closely with the Department of Health um, and local public health, and what's everybody's responsibilities? Um, it'd be great to be able to say, well, you know, MDH, we really can't do this. You just do it. And that's not the way it works. I mean, it, it's a local public health responsibility. And so um, MDH has their responsibilities. We have our responsibilities. Um, we help, you know, like right now. Um, because of our, our staffing situation, uh, MDH is like, okay, you know, we know that this is going to be another contact investigation. Just let us know what we can do for you to support you. But they can't do the work. And that's our, that's our job, especially in TB. That's the one that's very specific. That's the local public health responsibility. They're doing our pertussis. They're doing our um, measles if we would have one. Um, but and, and varicella, um, but TB, that's local. And that's a good thing because really we're the ones that are dealing with the family. We're the ones that are establishing the trust um, with the family. And it, it takes a lot of trust um, to be able to go to someone and say, 
Who all have you been talking to lately? Who's been in your home? Where have you been traveling to? What, you know, um, and it's a struggle sometimes because some of our families are very um, concerned about their privacy and don't like to share that. So the, the thought process in some of this, um, whose responsibilities is whose, is looking at who's going to have the relationship with the family um, to be able to, to do um, the best job at the case investigation. And typically it's local public health because we're here. Um, so that's kind of the framework part of that question. Uh, what else? Well, and we did have input in the framework. So when it came out in draft form, um, and I also sit on the Environmental Health uh, Community Improvement Board, so there was some opportunities for us to weigh in. Um, the bottom line is that these are local public health responsibilities. MDH is currently helping us with our pertussis um, investigations until they can't. And right now there's measles in Minnesota and a pertussis outbreak, so at some point, they may say, I'm sorry, it has exceeded our ability and it's back to you, local public health. That's part of the problem. I mean, how do you, we can't in a year or in a day, I mean, on Friday, I mean, this, the numbers on here were obsolete as of Friday because we got two more pertussis, pertussis cases. We have to respond whether we have 10 pertussis or TB cases, 10 TB cases, or 100 TB cases. It's like the refugees. Normally we get four to seven a year. We had almost 187 last year, 100 the year before, and we haven't changed our staffing model. So what do we need to do in order, again, we can't predict it, so what, what happens when all of a sudden, in, like in May and June, we got 51 new refugees. That's like an, an, a number that is astronomical for us. And actually for Scott County per capita, we've had the lion's share of refugees. Um, if you look at the state map, uh, we're like in the darker color. We've gotten a lot of the refugees in Scott County for various reasons. We have a lot of refugees coming from the Ukraine. They're coming here because their families here or the Baptist church is here and the refugee settlement is matching them to where they want to go. Um, this causes a huge surge in our cases. Um, so we have implemented um, some things uh, in order to uh, meet that need. Um, what has helped is VDOT going 90% uh, virtual, so that is increased efficiency, freeing up our staff. We have used an intermittent staff person to do a lot of our refugee health assessments. We found her during COVID and we've kept her because <laughs> she was fantastic and we would not be able to do that work um, without, without Marie and I'll let you speak to some of the work that you've been doing in a minute. The other pieces we've been doing more recently is um, we have implemented a partial continuity of operations. We are pulling back on some of our non-essential services because always life, safety, and health of the community comes first. Prevention activities is later. So we have, um, we're only going to the JAF in person once a week. Uh, we are not currently completing full early childhood screenings because that takes a nurse. Um, we, MGH is doing our pertussis as we've mentioned, and we are gonna start having conversations if we should start canceling our health matters clinic are in person and just going to our model that we were using during COVID where we we're just doing essential prescription refills. Um, we're also pulling our child and teen checkup coordinator because that's prevention work and we're moving her over to do some of the TB work. Again, prevention will fall behind. We're still gonna do our vaccinations because that's one of the problems that we're seeing right now that's causing the pertussis outbreak. And we talked a little bit about this during our community health board meeting is our vaccination rate has dropped below 90%. Um, MMR is at 86.5% or 86.4%. It's the lowest we've seen in a long, long time. These specific things are leading directly to these outbreaks, pertussis, and, and we also have a measles outbreak. So focusing on life safety, health, and moving staff where we need to move them. Unfortunately, we have, you know, VDOT this morning, and that would take, take a little bit of presence over this, unfortunately, and Michael was a little bit late, but it was because he was conducting an essential service. Did that answer all parts yes, of that question? Yeah. Okay. That was the theme. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> so I'll follow up on that, and I see on the screen a popped uh, page six. So I, it ties into that again, and this is the percentage of children immunized by entrance into kindergarten. So I think you're hitting on that. So, you know, 
how do what are the steps to get this back to those those target goals? Is, is the the decrease last few years from COVID, education, refugees you hit on? You know, what are some factors, and what are the next? What are steps moving forward to get back to trend to those target goals? You know, it, I think it's a very um, uh, complicated thing. All of those things are part of it. I think um, COVID didn't help us with the whole vaccine thing. Um, so people have then moved, I'm not going to get the COVID vaccine to I'm not going to get my kids vaccinated. So I think we've had to deal with some of that. So really working with um, outreach, um, clinics are very involved, you know, um, talking with their their own patients. And because again, you want you want the trusted relationship to be the one that's providing the information. So um, providers in the clinics are talking with, with their families about immunization and trying to give good, sound immunization information. Um, you know, we certainly work with our, um, our families, our refugee families, um, uh, all of the families that we come in contact with ab about immunizations. WIC talks about immunizations. CTC talks about immunizations. So um, we're covering all of that. Um, we do uh, our immunization clinics. So we have two funding sources for immunizations. Um, so we have the Minnesota Vaccine for Children, um, and that allows us to vaccinate any child um, that is uninsured, underinsured, meaning that for whatever reason their insurance doesn't cover a certain vaccine or some set of vaccines. Um, and then if they have medical assistance, they can come to us and we can vaccinate them. Um, we also have the um, un and underinsured adult vaccine program. Um, and that program is where we can uh, um, immunize any un or underinsured adult um, with the adult vaccines. Uh, that program, this year for the first time, we were allotted a certain amount of money, as was every county in the state, was allotted a certain amount because they're so um, short of money in that program. And so, you know, we've already spent our allocation for the year, and the year doesn't start again until October 1st. So um, right now, we can't get any more adult vaccine, except um, they are going to continue to provide us with um, varicella, MMR, COVID, COVID and um, Tdap. So those are the only vaccines now that we can offer to adults um, because we're out of money. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be any better next year. So we've also added a vaccination clinic time to accommodate the increase in need. If you look on page seven, you can see also our number of vaccinations that we've been given has also dramatically increased. We did 924 in 2023, and we're on target to exceed probably about 1,000 if it stays consistent between now and then. Um, and in order to, I mean, obviously we need more time if we're giving out more vaccines, so we've added a clinic. Um, okay, can we go to page 10, please? Um, so this data looks at referrals of refugees for health assessment. And is, is it correct that public health is required to help link them to a clinic in 90 days? Is that the requirement? The requirement is that they have their health assessment completed within 90 days of arrival. Okay, thank you. And so I wonder... Um, um, Lisa, maybe from like a, a director level, if you could just very quickly explain the difference between a refugee and an immigrant. And then, Maria, I, I got a follow up question for you. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you have to apply. Refugees typically are people that are displaced from their um, country of origin due to civil disrest, war, things like that, um, then they can apply to come to the states as a refugee. Now that's all run by the federal government. The federal government 
determines at the beginning of the fiscal year for which refugees, I believe, is September 1st. Um, they'll look and project and say that this is how many refugees we're going to have this year. Um, and they, you know, they stick to that number. And then, um, so then the, the refugees are, are done. I don't know how they choose which ones from where, but that's how the refugees come to us. We know that they're coming ahead of time, or the, the state does, um, and that they let us know. Um, uh, all of the refugees um, qualify for a set of benefits called um, the uh, um, refugee health benefits. Um, those benefits include uh, medical assistance, um, it, it used to be six months. I think they have it now for a year. And then they work with a resettlement agency um, that helps them with housing, furnishing their house, helping them find jobs, transportation, things like that. They help them get settled. Um, so that's a refugee. Um, the Department of Health sends us, like I said, those refugees um, so that we have those names and we know, you know, a lot about them because they all have a refugee health exam prior to coming. Um, and then once they come, then we do their refugee health ex um, assessment, um, or help, sorry, help schedule them for a refugee health assessment with a clinic. Okay. The immigrants, um, they apply through immigration um, to resettle in the United States. Um, immigrants are not eligible for those refugee health benefits. So, um, in fact, they are not eligible to apply for medical assistance. They can apply for um, Minnesota care, but they can't apply for medical assistance. They're not eligible for that. There's a time frame that they have to be here and, and things like that before they can apply um, and be eligible for medical assistance. So, um, immigrants, there's... Um, they do have some health um, things that they have to do prior to coming over here. And where we get involved with immigrants is only if they come over here with a class B, meaning there's something from their overseas um, um, exam that is a little funky for TB. So they maybe had an abnormal chest x-ray, they maybe had um, uh, some TB symptoms, and so before they can come over, then they have to do some further testing. Um, and then when they come to us, we get them because we then uh, get them connected with a clinic that can um, complete the, um, uh, the exam for, to rule out active TB. And then if they're latent, then we um, help them with treatment. Okay. And our goal is to make sure that they get um, their assessment done within the 90 days and also connect them to, like, help them find a medical home so we don't continue their care. Sure. So then, Marie, is there, are there, uh, like, looking at this Class B refugee, so these are people that have TB or have some high risk for TB. Is there some prioritization as you are working in refugee communities for those Class B individuals? Yes, those are people that when I see them uh, referred to us, we immediately take a look at them, contact those clients, and prioritize those okay. in getting them into the clinic uh, for their assessment, their blood test, their test x-ray, that kind of thing. And then typically we're talking to the whole family because a lot of our refugees and, and class Bs are coming as part of a family just to ensure the safety and health of the family. People around them, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. One of the complications that we found, being having so many of um, refugee health assessments needed, we ran, out of, we ran out of clinics that had space to take them, and Jody has worked with a new clinic, Arise, I think Arise, it is. Yeah. Um, we had to find another location because it was taking more than 90 days to get them in, and we just didn't have enough providers in Scott County uh, to see these folks. So. Um, now we've been really lucky to have a new, uh, find a new partnership uh, versus us trying to do that on our own. So going back to the water testing a little bit, um, had some questions about, um, as I understand the, the well tests here that you're talking about are all private wells. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if they do test positive for some of these resources or some of these um, particular um, problems, uh, what kinds of things do we do to help uh, the residents with that? If they get a test, do we get actively involved in this or is this just information that they then have to kind of work through the system to figure out what to do to improve their water quality? Yep. Yeah, so um, it's, we don't really offer any like mitigation. We've applied for grants and stuff like that to try and, well, have the ability to do something. But um, as of right now, um, we just, we're just the messenger. We're just letting the, them know that they're high and then we can kind of give them, steer them in the right direction, whether, whether it's the Department of Health or just like regular things like a reverse osmosis machine or filters or anything like that that can mitigate the, that specific contaminant that they that they tested positive for. Um, Lisa, can, or someone, I'm not sure. Um, earlier, someone spoke to the fact uh, that um, early childhood screenings were no longer being completed, and you know that's uh, been a priority for this board. Um, so, like, in the alternative, what is happening with that? Um, well, uh, just to clarify, we're not completing full early childhood screenings on site right now uh, because we don't have nursing available. However, um, uh, in July and I think a couple days in August, um, our child and teen checkup coordinator, we're partnering with uh, Shakopee School District, and they'll be uh, going over to the school district to do the screenings there because they were short a nurse. And this is also enabling them to add some early childhood screening days for the kids that already had appointment and, okay. and were able to make appointments. We are doing, because we have prevention staff, we are um, doing a big push uh, to do a lot of outreach. We've been connecting a lot of kids to early childhood screens. The data is showing that a bulk of the kids that are, um, being make, are making appointments are hearing about it from public health. Um, so we are still doing uh, the outreach and the connection with the school district and getting kids to where they need to be um, and getting them um, in for their early childhood screening. So that work is still happening. The only thing that we're not able to do right now because of lack of staff um, is the actual full early childhood screening. Okay, thank you for that clarifier. All right. Um, is there one additional question from the facilitators? I was just going to ask a question regarding your next steps that you've documented in your summary. Um, you've talked a little bit about what you've been doing with the refugee health assessments and partnering, but you also mentioned some collaboration with River Valley and some collaboration <coughs> potentially with coordinated response. Do you want to speak to what you're thinking of in terms of the future to support your team? Um, as far as River Valley, um, for those of you who don't know, River Valley um, Health Center um, is now part of the CAP agency. They're less than a, they're about a mile away. They now have physicians there as well. If we do pull back on some of our health matters clinics, it's likely that we'll refer some of our clients uh, over there, um, and we'll see we'll see if that is a possibility of because um, we really want to ensure that our clients have a place to go um, and have a health care home um, and these are typically ones that are have like absolutely no insurance 99 percent of the thing i think our clients are are uninsured and a couple are un underinsured so if river valley can pick up that um, we may take a look at some future discussion on um, if they can maybe fill that gap on a on a a long-term basis. We also have the opportunity to partner with Open Door. They have been coming, uh, well, they're supposed to be here twice a month um, and provide uh, medical services. So taking a look at through partnerships, how can we fill this gap and do we need to continue even continuing with the Health Matters Clinic? Um, the other piece, um, the coordinated response team, I would kind of want to take a look at if this is a possibility to improve the service that we're already delivering. Um, taking a look at how can we uh, help some of our, particularly the hoarding cases, um, with their mental health issues so we don't have to, I mean, it's, it's, it's for us so we can not come back uh, month after month. I still have cases from three or four years ago that are unresolved on the inside, but it doesn't rise to a public health nuisance. But in one, in, for example, in one situation, they aren't able to live in the home. They're living in a hotel because their home is uninhabitable. And how can I maybe tie in 
some mental health resources for that family um, because it's technically not a public health nuisance anymore because it's only impacting that family. So looking at different ways of doing things um, and, um, and basically improving our service so they will rely less on public health. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Mm -mm. No. All right, um, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, um, these folks are on their way out to deal with the new TB cases, so I told them we would keep this briefer this morning. So I'd like to stop at this point um, and give it back to the board. Thank you very much. Yes, colleagues, any questions on the topic? I was just going to ask about the water testing. You know, there's that water plant going out there in Elko in the Market. Mm -hmm. You've heard about that. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, there was a lot of testing that was done around that. Could that explain some of the numbers? or What kind of testing? Wasn't there, Kate, was there a lot of testing out there for, wasn't there some well clinics or something? Oh, thank you, Tracy. So as part of the um, request for the no, so can no, maybe come up to the uh, somewhere. Yeah. There, there we go. go. Oh, okay. That's the so as part of uh, the request for that water supply well for the city and for of the possible um, water bottling company, the DNR required a, a pump out test, which is a, a test on the aquifer's capability to provide that water. Um, and then some of, I saw a Star Tribune article, I didn't hear this myself, but I saw the article that um, some homes had some problems and that was more sediment mm -hmm. uh, that they were finding in their home and a few other things that were changing the color of the water. Um, so none of those uh, homeowners that were having trouble requested a kit from the county. They were working directly with the city and the DNR. I see. Okay. Huh. And that sediment in the water, is that, even I have, I'm on a well, I, I have that from time to time. Is that common? Yes, from time to time you yep. might get sediment in your well. That older pump might be causing the problem. Oh. Um, so the best uh, thing to do is to call your pumper, or I'm sorry, not your pump, uh, your well, well driller, yep. okay. your well driller, and see what's causing the sediment in okay. your in your water. Okay. Hmm. Uh, also, we also have a um, uh, a lot of mineral in our water, so it could be sediment, or you could be getting you you have hard water here in Scott County, so you could be seeing some of that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I've, I've got one, um, and I thank you for that definition of the whole asylum seeker and refugee, because I feel like we had a workshop about three, four, five, six years ago. So all refugees start out as asylum seekers, if that's the right term, but they don't, not all asylum seekers make it to that refugee status is that and we're not in charge of that status yeah, no we're not in charge of that i'm not really sure if they start off as asylum seekers well they're, they're but however they're entering the yeah, system they, they're they're they've been displaced and are moved to what's called the refugee camp but yeah a refugee that's just that's the term the federal government gives them and this is what it means. Um, you know, they get this uh, for the first six months or a year that they come here. And so that's... Because I'm trying to remember back in the day, um, which wasn't that long ago, but the, the border crisis, whatever, is it a direct correlation of that or not necessarily because it's a completely different... It's, com it's yeah. I but mean, they get blurred. They the get blurred. Crisis with, with Mexico or... Just in general. Well, that's the one specifically. Yes, I mean since so, we're so close to the northern border, but um, right. yeah. So those are those are asylum seekers. They're not refugees, um, and there's they won't be, you know, labeled as refugees. They don't fit the criteria of as, as refugees. Um, they are asylum seekers, which has some very similar, you know, their concern of their safety. Um, so they're seeking asylum in the United States. Um, or in another country, um, and and they have different criteria. So most asylum seekers um, are not eligible for refugee benefits, um, although they have designated some countries that 
they can get refugee benefits. Like Haiti, we've had a couple asylees from Haiti that um, received, they can get refugee health benefits. Um, they're not refugees, but they can get those benefits. So it, it's gotten so complicated. I have to refer back to the table constantly to see, okay, does this one get, does this one not? It, so it's really gotten convoluted um, and, and hard. Because then, of course, you throw in the humanitarian parolees, too. Because that's the other, like all of our Ukrainians are humanitarian mm -hmm. parolees. They're not refugees. They're not asylees. They're parolees. <laughs> so that's a workshop maybe for another day. Uh, <laughs> but the TB tends to kind of correlate to the, as the refugee status well, or not so necessarily? Not, I mean, not necessarily. So the majority um, of TB uh, is foreign. However, um, since I've been here, I know we had one um, gentleman that was not foreign-born. Um, some of our current um, cases are not foreign-born. Um, there's some tied to travel, mm -hmm. but they're not. They were born in the U.S. So, um, so yeah, it, it's not a direct correlation. Like I said, the refugees are all tested before they come. They're tested when they get here. We hopefully. Um, can convince them um, and with good um, education that they should, if they do come up as a positive um, IGRA, the blood test for TB, that they get treated for um, latent tuberculosis to prevent um, um, futuristically developing TB. And that is incredibly labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And the video portion seems to be working well. I know we just talked about that not that long ago, but the number of visits that's cut down, I mean, virtual visits seems well, to be yeah. working. It, it certainly helps with the timing. Now, it does concern me sometimes that we're, you know, that for some of, you know, like I think of a couple of them that we have right now that are elderly, you know, their liver function studies are elevated. You know, are we, are we having to see them on video too much? Should we be mm -hmm. in the home and looking at them in the eyeballs because we want to see if there's any yellowing going on and that can be harder to see over a video so that does concern me you know that maybe we are relying too heavily on video DTs okay. but um, at this point in time we seem to be doing okay Good to know. Well, with no other questions, and we want to keep uh, um, it to seven, not eight or nine. Or, so we want to get you out in the field. Uh, okay. I was trying to be <laughs> hopeful and wishful and all those things. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate the good work.